Welcome to Discover Indie Film. I'm your host, Jeff Howard, and I am on Zoom right now with two wonderful people, a filmmaking team who, when I name the films involved, I uh, have a star in my eye. But Brandon C. Lay and Sarah Cugini, good to see you both. Hello. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. So as I said, we're on Zoom. They're in Pennsylvania. I'm in California, so I had to be Zoom. But uh, these two are responsible for two films that have been at the Festival Light program. The first is Bitter Taste of Ginger, and that is actually a repeat offender. Bitter Taste of Ginger showed up at the Sherman Oaks Film Festival in 2021, and it took home the Grand Jury Award for Best Feature Film, Our House Experimental. And then Sarah herself took home Best Actress in a Lead Role. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then, like good sports, you you also sent it in for Film Invasion LA uh, the following year in 2022. So that was just actually amazingly only three three and a half months ago. Although it feels like ages to me. It feels like so much longer. Yeah. Doesn't it? Really? Yeah, three and a half months. But uh, and and at Film Invasion LA 2022, the rare repeat. You know, I didn't bother telling you this, but like. Sometimes the jury is a little biased against films that have already gotten awards. Cause, oh, gotcha. Because they like to spread the love. Yeah, of course. But again, Sarah took home Best Actress in a Lead Role. So <laughs> I'm doing my, uh, for them on Zoom, I'm doing a golf clap. Yes, thank you. Or, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and also, if you can't tell by my tone and maybe Brandon and Sarah's tone, because you didn't make it out for either festival, this is, I guess, our third Zoom because we did a Zoom Q and A for in November of 2021, and for then sure. I think we did another one right in June of 20. 20- I don't know that we did a, the second one. I don't know that we ever were able to. I think it's because of this. I think it was like I'm going to have you on the podcast mm-hmm. and really? we'll talk okay. both films. Yeah, I think so. So I've just fooled myself into thinking I've had more conversations with you. Well, we're now Facebook friends, so we're like commenting on yeah, each other's posts. Yeah, we're on posts Facebook, and, and we've emailed like a hundred times plus about both scheduling this podcast and just general stuff so yeah yes in this weird world of zoom and the internet uh i feel like you two are friends oh agreed oh thanks right likewise (laughs) isn't it weird how it happens yeah at some point in time we are definitely going to come out for one of the festivals Mm -hmm. um and and make that happen. Uh, we're still traveling a little bit with uh, Bitter Taste of Ginger. It's it's ending its circuit now, probably ending. We might do a few more here and there, but um, the bulk of it's going to be done at the very beginning of October, um, the first, the last weekend of September into October mm-hmm. um, will be the uh, Macabre Fair Film Festival in Tennessee, which we're traveling to, and uh, and I think that'll be the 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 end of the. Of its run mm-hmm. at 26 official selections. 26 festivals. That's yeah. that's really great. That's great. Yeah, thanks. And I mean, oh, so and so you actually are still on the festival circuit. So at this point, there's not a way to tell people, hey, this is where you can go see it. Not just yet, but soon. Not just yet, but soon. All right. So when that happens, as we're we're I will I will add it to the show notes because awesome. Because, I don't know, we can avoid, you know, this is going to be more about your two personal histories anyway. So we can healthfully avoid uh, spoilers. But I'll add, I mean, you submitted Bitter Taste of Ginger to the Art House Experimental category. And it's, I mean, it's a, I consider it a, a challenging, bold film that that you had the the courage to make a film that's not for everybody. And then to hear like 20 plus festivals and, and I do see the awards that you, you both are getting on, on your social media. And I'm like, that's rad that the world is responding to quality. Like that's how it's supposed to be. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. It it took, it's, uh, it's, it was definitely, I mean, we don't share the ones we didn't get into, Mm -hmm. of course. Uh, And, and the very pleasant messages we we get um, saying, the ones that uh, that drive me bananas are are well. I, I hate form letters in general, but the the ones that have like one line of like a personal note, like I really loved your film, but it's not getting in. It's just like like it, and I I do appreciate that they took the time to do that, but at the same time, it's like oh that like I just feel like oh so close, but not actually in there. Um, yeah. Would you rather? Well, this is an unimportant question, but would you rather they just say sorry, didn't get in? 
Or do you, or is it nicer if they say, cause maybe everyone gets the same form letter that says we loved your work, but it's not in. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I cannot stand form letters, but I at least understand like the process, like just keep it moving. Like yes, no in out kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the ones with the message, it's usually like a line or two and it's noticeably not form letter. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's got a little bit of detail in there. It's got a little bit of, um, uh, you know, if your film is tough to program, which I know, like it's not, yeah. it's and you not going to be for saw. everybody. You, the point yeah. is you can tell someone watched it and they yes. really are addressing it. Yeah. The, the thing that I found actually the most aggravating uh, was the fact that we didn't get into a lot of festivals that took the year off for COVID or a year and a half off for COVID. And they, they doubled up the submissions. They didn't, they didn't um, do like a double, you know, festival, like twice as many screenings. So we were uh, in competition with twice as many films and, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to let that uh, kind of aggravated me a little bit because you know, it's, we paid the same submission fee, you know what I mean? And it's, and, um, you know, we're, we're the little guys, as far as the indie world goes, it's all out of our own pocket kind of situation. And each submission really is, you know, um, a decision like financially, like to make, to submit to this many, you know, so that was, that was tough. I would, I mean, I know, that you make a, you're actually very productive and, and the two of you make a lot of, I mean, Oh wait, I didn't mention cue ball enough in the intro, son of a bitch, but uh, <laughs> That's you right. also, yeah. your, your short film cue ball was, was also at Sherman Oaks. I'm sorry. It was at film invasion LA in 2022. Yeah. And uh, so I, I know you keep doing stuff. So I, I don't know. Well, we can, you, I'll, I was almost going to ask you if you've got enough of the, equipment and everything that you can keep making films without like spending a ton of money renting equipment and stuff. But I was, it was all to get to the idea that it's entirely possible for indie filmmakers to spend more on festival submission fees than they do on the goddamn movie. Mm -hmm. That was 100% the case with cue ball for sure. For sure. Like, absolutely. And I never rent, I have never rented a piece of equipment ever in my life and never will. It's always like purchase, have, be able to keep making stuff. And that would be my recommendation to pretty much any up and coming filmmaker. We've been doing it for a while now. And, uh, but anybody up and coming, like buy the camera you can afford. Like there is a certain expectation nowadays for, you know, 4k, like to have that capability. Um, so, I mean, but there are cheap enough cameras out there that you can do that with and preferably find something that has like, uh, a raw capability where you can actually manipulate the image with color correction and everything like that and have some deep, decent sound equipment and then just start making stuff, just start making shit. Like just, just start doing it. And, uh, and it really isn't as expensive the habit there. It's an expensive habit. Like the way drugs are like the the initial thing is really not that bad, but as you want to make it better and as you keep making more things, it gets increasingly expensive. So be warned there, but if you love it, if it's what you have to do, then just get it, like get the equipment, do not waste your money renting stuff because your first movie is going to be bad. Like it's just going to be it's going to be bad. So don't spend all this money renting really good equipment and make a good looking film from like a equipment wise that you spend tons of money on. That's terrible. Yeah, that's absolutely. My... Absolutely. And it is, and it is a promising world we live in now, right? Because you get some good equipment that's prosumer and, and a lot of it can pass. I mean, Lord knows I've seen films where, where the filmmaker shot most of it on a red and then had to do pickups with their iPhone. And once you run it through, you know, corrections and stuff, it's indistinguishable. It can be. But, uh, but I was just going to say that, yeah, it, it's, it's a wonderful time, especially because all the post stuff is more attainable now too. Like, yes, you know, I'm, I am old enough that in my day, you know, indie people, we still had to shoot on film and, develop it and that was just and then edit on 
on a system that was ridiculously expensive. So yeah, it's, it's really, it's a really promising time, I think for indie filmmakers. Yeah, I think it can be, it comes with its own challenges, but from that end of things, like the actual making of it, like there's no excuse not to be making it. If that's your passion, there's just, there is literally no excuse as far as I'm concerned. Exactly. There's just the, the son of a bitch is, is really, is getting it out to the public. <laughs> it's, that's one of them for sure yeah getting the eyeballs yeah it's like uh what so there are no more art house theaters there are no more yeah it's, the world's changing but here we are just chatting and as i promised you we would get into your personal histories here so let's jump in with sarah okay. sarah you you are a multiple award-winning actress and uh have a great screen presence so where did it all start for you Um, I mean, when I was younger, I was always in choir, uh, grew up singing. Uh, The high school that I went to is actually a performing arts high school. I went there and majored in vocal performance, but I also did musical theater, theater on the side. And uh, growing up, I just, I loved movies. Um, My parents introduced me to old films, Marx Brothers, um, you know, uh, The Thin Man, stories, stuff like that. So I always loved film and I always wanted to be a part of that world, that community. Uh, So it just kind of, it started from an early age and just kind of blossomed from there. (laughs) And the performing arts high school, that was a conscious choice. You, you were, yes, it it works like a magnet program in a way. Yes. Um, It had started a couple years earlier and I knew some people that had gone there and I decided, you know, let me, let me try this. This is a little bit different. Um, I love singing, but then like once I got into it and I started learning all these different techniques and then doing musical theater and I just started realizing, wow, I really do have a passion for this. Um, so if I, I don't, if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for that school, I don't think I would be here today doing this. (laughs) And at the school, and obviously a lot of stage, did they at that high school level, were they also like playing with cameras and putting you on camera a little bit? Uh, not as much. Um, it was just primarily live stage, uh, musicals, operas, um, very little film at that point. Um, but always in the back of my head, I wanted to make that transfer to film. Um, but I thought, you know, at least to get my feet wet, I'll do stage at that point. And, and uh, you were more interested in in moving towards acting on film, acting on camera, than like finishing high school and rushing off to to Broadway. Yes, <laughs> um, I I thought about it and I said, okay, well, let me go to college, let me get a degree in something. And actually, my degree is in comparative literature with a minor in English. And um, Right now, I'm actually an ophthalmology technician, so it's a little bit, you know, my day job's a little bit different, but hopefully one day uh, I can kind of make it so that I can do film all the time. And, okay, the the literary degree, mm-hmm. how does that, uh, when when Brandon hands you a new script, is it... I, is, does, is your great knowledge of literary uh, techniques, are you, are you a focused reader in that way? Yes. And I also noticed a lot of all, you know, the spelling errors and punctuation errors as well. But I just, I don't tell him because I don't want to hurt his heart. <laughs> well, and the errors are hurt my heart. less it's, important, right? I than know. The skill I'm well aware. Storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm a writer, not an editor. Yep. I tell everybody this. I will forever spell uh, dining room, dining room. Yep. It's just how my fingers type out the words. <laughs> like, it's just like I'm I, I'm beelining. Like, I'm, I'm on a different mission than worrying about if my words are correct. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, so, Sarah, after high school, college was literary. And were you still mm-hmm. acting? Like, uh, here and there. College theater or... Uh, a little bit. I mostly did um, singing primarily. That's what I had time for. And I also uh, did modeling on the side as well. So I was, you know, dabbling in that. And it wasn't until after I graduated, I started, I did a few runway shows in New York. And then um, I started taking acting classes. And 
I just started going for auditions, local auditions, did a couple of films, and then met up with Brandon, went into one of his auditions, and the rest is history. <laughs> the rest is history. Wait, I'm going to make you go back in time. One more, one more moving backwards question. Sure. Which is, when you mentioned singing in, in college, mm-hmm. is that like uh, stage singing, or, or were you fronting a band? Like, what, what kind of singing? I was primarily uh, choral ensembles. Um, that's oh, what I've done. Yes, yes, <laughs> very highbrow. <laughs> I, I, I think I'm going to finally, just for shits and giggles, well, I just said shit, but I'm going to throw in the first curse word, like, you're pretty fucking highbrow. With the literary degree and choral yes. singing, that's like, yes. like, you know, that's not I'm very like punk pinky. <laughs> <laughs> very, very pink, high pinky here. Yes. Very, you, very highbrow. You'd never know it the second she starts talking about anime and Pokemon <laughs> and cosplaying and all of their kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'd be like, who is this weird kid? Like, kid. No, but wow, that just shows cute. balance, right? It shows balance yeah. that. It shows the intellectual side mm-hmm. and as well as ability to enjoy. Although it's funny because like that stuff is pop culture now, but it was underground, I assume, when you first got into it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's actually I got bullied a lot in school because I liked stuff that is now popular. So it's kind of like, well, I'm the OG, but. Well. Yeah, people bullied. <laughs> isn't it crazy? People bullied kids if they, you know. We're mm-hmm. fans of things out of Japan. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, uh, yeah, now it's just dominant. It's still it's still crazy. It's still something that I talk about with friends. Uh, the fact that, you know, San Diego Comic-Con was once mm-hmm. just like, if you went there, you it was proof that you would never have a date. Yep. Yep. And now it's like. The hub of Hollywood is just completely, yeah. <laughs> completely mass media, full on. It is culture. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. So then, and then you met Brandon. How how did you meet him? So uh, I was part of a Facebook page for local actors, local actresses, and I saw that somebody had posted a casting call. So I said, "All right, let me let me try it." I had done a few others, so I went. And I think I was there almost all day. Like, <laughs> it was kind of like an elimination audition. So there was a whole bunch of girls, and we were all there reading for the same part. And one by one, Brandon was like, okay, that's great. You can go. And then a couple hours later, okay, you can go now. And then it was down to me and one other girl. And I'm sweating bullets at this point because I'm like, oh, my God, am I going to get it? Am I not going to get it? Uh, so... I actually did not get that part, but Brandon was very impressed with what I brought to the table. And he said, well, I want you to be a part of this project, even if it's not for this specific part. So that kind of like got me into the, the world of living proof pictures and been, been here ever since. (laughs) And I guess I kind of failed as an interviewer because I didn't nail down exactly. I've, I've, I've used the word Pennsylvania a few times, But what part? Uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Bethlehem, which is uh, like medium-sized city, smaller city. Um, Where the little apple. Yeah. Where the little Little apple. apple. That's what Bethlehem likes to call (laughs) ourselves is the little apple. Yes. Uh, It's part of the Lehigh Valley. So it's Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton are the main like hubs of of the Lehigh Valley, Mm -hmm. which is bigger than that. But uh and uh yeah we bethlehem steel was our big like to do back in the day Mm -hmm. and now it's all becoming more of like an art scene um and we have a casino now which is a big deal but we also have all this historic stuff so it's it's a nice mix but it's a very artsy culture bethlehem is definitely my favorite of the lehigh valley Mm -hmm. and it's uh and so that also means you're how far west like you're pretty far or and uh, well see i I guess I'm trying to paint a picture in my head because I, I know how like Philadelphia is on the board of New Jersey. And it's like, you know, mm. like there's parts of Pennsylvania that feel very connected to the Eastern seaboard. For sure. Yeah. We're very close to New Jersey. Easton, if you're in Easton, it's the border right yeah. there with New Jersey. So we could be in New Jersey in 15 or 20 minutes that way, mm-hmm. or we could be going 
to Philadelphia about 45 minutes to an hour from here Mm -hmm. and get to New Jersey in a different area that way. Got it. But it's, but it's Eastern. So it's, it's part of the Eastern seaboard vibe. And sure. Cause like I've got, uh, I've got a friend, a filmmaker now I know who comes from like Western Pennsylvania, like farmland. Yeah. And of course, well, we've got plenty of that too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, I guess we got Sarah's story right up until uh, meeting you. And and I can, by the way, I'm not surprised at all that Sarah's story ended with she didn't get a specific role, but you said, but I want you in this project because, I mean, well, cue ball was obviously shot with a limited cast, but like Bitter Taste of Ginger, I get the vibe that that you almost like collecting talent and keeping talented people around you so that you can just throw them into projects. It's true. Yeah. I mean, I've got a wonderful team of people. There's the, the regular players is the, the title of it, like on the website and like on the team, the living proof pictures, regular players and which Sarah is among. And those are the people that I keep coming to multiple times that I'll write roles specifically for, you know, and, um, when it comes like we go outside of that as well. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes uh, I get inspired by someone or I really like writing for someone in particular. That's something that, um, you know, oftentimes I see a performer not getting a kind of role that I think they should get. And I'll write it for them because um, I come from an acting background. So I remember what it was like. Um, one, not being seen for what I might be good at, but also the horrors of loving an art form that 100% requires someone else saying you're good enough or saying you can do it or inviting you to be a part of it. And I hated that. I hate gatekeeping in general, just, I I can't stand it. Um, and you know, as the director of a film, as the person doing the casting and whatnot, you know, I do have to gatekeep, you know, it is part of, doing it. I can't say yes to everybody. And frankly, I won't like, I want talented people around me. Um, but I try to mitigate it as much as possible. I, I do have open auditions, um, to kind of like work backwards from Sarah's story a little bit. Uh, when Sarah auditioned, uh, I oftentimes will have, especially if I'm casting a large role that I didn't write specifically for someone, I'll do auditions more like I remember them from, like college theater auditions, you know, where because everybody was there to learn, right. You were like the whole group of people were there at the audition, seeing everybody audition. It wasn't a matter of just like you walking into a room and getting auditioned. I don't know how it is at all colleges, but that was how it was for me. And I love certain aspects of that so much Because most people that are auditioning, especially in like a community theater or like indie film kind of way, you know, a lot of people have day jobs and other things going on and they just want to be a part of the art. And I'm not going to be able to bring everybody in. A lot of people might not be ready to do this kind of work that we do, Um, but I want them to get at least an experience from it. So as Sarah mentioned, like there was a large group of women that auditioned um, and you know, I tried to give everybody the time of day. Now, I'll be honest, like, here it is with the form letter thing again, like the idea of the form letter and like keeping it moving. There's one side where I understand the desire to like, just keep everything moving. We got a job to do like, thank you. Goodbye. Like I get that. And it's easier for people to do when it's a form letter via email. Right. Um, I don't want to give anybody that kind of experience when they audition. Now, someone that's more experienced might get annoyed by that. Like I spent an hour here and I didn't get the part and I went up and read like three times and just had to sit there watching other people do it. And for some people, like I get that, but for many people that are auditioning, like to have the experience of being a part of it and understanding it and exploring it like you're in a rehearsal for that hour or for two hours or whatever, um, might be more meaning for to them to have that experience. And also for whoever I do end up casting, they're going to have to understand that there's a rehearsal process, that it's not like other film sets where it's like, you have your lines. We maybe talked a couple times and you show up on set and we do it. 
this is an exploration and we want to make the best thing we can. So when Sarah auditioned, uh, that's what was happening was, you know, I was, you know, letting people go as time went on, but trying to give them all the time of day. And I'll know oftentimes within the first 30 seconds to a minute, you know, if, if like, if they're ready to really be doing it, but I want the, I want them to leave a better performer as silly as maybe that's like not my job to worry about it, but I want them to have that experience and be like, you are definitely not ready to be in my casting room. That said, whatever stage you are at, I want you to be able to leave. And maybe when I cast again in a year, if you wanted to come back, maybe you would be ready, or maybe you'll be ready for the community theater thing that you might audition for later. And I'll might prepare you a little better for that. Um, but yeah, it did get narrowed down to Sarah and two other young ladies, um, Torres Mosley, who's another one of our regular players who ended up getting the role, and another young lady named uh, Sierra Saka, who does play her part in Bitter Taste of Ginger, and she had been in something beforehand, and she she did great. Like she had really improved a lot, um, and was definitely a contender. Um, and we still get to work together, obviously, on Bitter Taste of Ginger. And Sarah on the page was perfect for the role that I had written, which is why she was there for so long. Uh, Perfect. However, uh, Therese in this case brought more than I was looking for, brought something I hadn't ever imagined and brought more in this case out of um, the performer she was working with, Sid Stauffer, who's also in this piece, uh, Bitter Taste of Ginger. Um, And she was playing the lead. So they were all auditioning and rehearsing with the person they'd be playing the scene with. So, um, so yeah, Torres brought some really interesting things out of Sid. So she ended up getting the role, but I was like, I can't, I'm not going to let Sarah just walk back out on the street. Like, you know, um, so she was in a one scene role. And then from there it was 24 hour film race pieces. And pretty soon I would say within the first four to five months uh, of us working together on like that limited series and a short, um, I approached her with the first stages of bitter taste of ginger. Like I had like 15 pages written. And yeah. well, I'm, I'm not going to ask you that the question I'm about to ask him to shift gears. Cause sure. what we didn't do is get back to young Brandon. So when did your creative journey begin? Well, I come from creative parents Um, uh, my dad is a writer and when he was younger made films with, um, my uncle Jeff and other friends, not blood uncle, family friend uncle. Um, yeah. And while I never got to work with real film, um, I saw the films that they made. They made a series called the dark traveler, um, which was very Solomon Kane ish. Um, and, or, they were before Highlander, but very similar to Highlander, but like made with no budget and just kind of like running around, but they did a lot of great stuff. And my uncle Jeff was the director and my dad was the lead actor. And, uh, you know, I heard stories about my uncle Jeff having to work in like a dank basement with like all the rolls of film, like hanging from the ceiling and him like actually cutting the movie together And um, they had some effects in it, like they shot lightning bolts or a fireball. And he would, with a with a hot needle, actually like scrape the each frame of the film to create the fire or lightning coming out of their hands. And um, so my dad is a bit of a hedonist. He's not nearly as hard of a worker as I am. And he he won't deny that. Um, But uh, hearing those stories of my uncle Jeff, like doing that, like I knew the dedication And, uh, so I kind of followed my dad's footsteps at first with the writing aspect and the acting aspect. Uh, and my mom was a more visual artist, a fine artist. She passed away, uh, eight years ago now. Eight. Yeah. Eight years ago in, in April, uh, she would have been 60 this year and, uh, fine artist, and definitely had an eye, um, very spiritual person. And, uh, you know, I got some of my eye from my mom for sure. And also a more, 
I guess, poetic way of approaching my art. Um, but again, neither of them were really hard workers when it came to doing their stuff and, um, love my family. However, um, uh, mo- pretty much the examples I had, um, were a failure of not accomplishing their dreams. And, um, the pieces I saw missing wasn't the passion. They were very passionate about what they did, but was, um, my dad freely admits that he was waiting for that knock on the door of like someone being like, Oh, there you are. There's, there's Chris. There he is, you know? And, um, you know, I had a bit of that because I was an only child. So I was very puffed up to believe that I was the the second coming, like that I was going to appear on the scene and everybody was going to be, Oh, there he is. He's, we've been waiting for you. Um, however, very quickly, I was also like, I grew up poor and I was like, I'm only going to get the things that I earn. So I was always a hard worker and it started with acting and then I didn't get the opportunities that I wanted. And I was always a writer as well. So I started writing myself roles and then, um, is that, I, is that like a, like high school age or high early? school was a lot of writing. Yeah. High school was uh, writing poetry and I wrote a novel that I self published at 18 and it's not good. It is very, very bad. Um, but I did it. I wrote a whole novel at 17 and self-published it at 18. Um, and was big into photography and did a, cu- did a f- couple films for like classes and things. Uh, my best friend, Phil and I, he's also a regular player. Um, we made a movie our senior year. Everybody in class was supposed to make a film. We were the only ones that finished our movie of the entire class, and we made a feature. Again, it was terrible, but we did it, Um, which, uh, again, would be my advice to most people that are passionate about it. Like, it doesn't matter if it's good or not, especially when you're young. Just do it. Like, actually get it done. Get it made. Or even if you're old, like, whatever stage you're at, you know, just you got to just do it. Uh, And... um, so yeah, started out, um, went to Northampton Community College for theater uh, with my best friend, Phil. We both went, uh, were in the same class where I met uh, a lot of people that I still work with as the regular players. Uh, Joshua Vitoros, he was a producer on this film. Uh, Elizabeth Archibek didn't, wasn't involved on this one, but we still work together regularly. Maria Sole was in Bitter Taste of Ginger, but her scene was cut. Um and I'm sure there are others at the moment that I'm forgetting, but, um, but yeah, so originally it was going to be theater and I started writing the roles for myself and then realized I had a gift for writing roles for other people. And, um, I learned a lot from my fellow performers as a performer myself and then realized, Oh, I see what they're gifted at too. Like I know what they're good at because I want to absorb it for me. And then once I took that selfish side out of it and focused it on just like, Oh, I see what's wonderful about you and I can help you cultivate that. And obviously still partly selfishly, like I can help you cultivate that for the movie I want to make or the play I want to do. Um, but it's, it's not rooted in that selfishness. It was rooted in that, like we could make something awesome. And so at 19, I wrote a script called Bloodstone, a feature length film, black and white with all college uh, kids. Again, we were in theater. I had no real money. A guy named Jason George loaned me equipment. He owns King Coffee in Emmaus. And he just gave me this equipment to borrow. And it was like mini V uh, DV tapes, the little and um, shot it in black and white feature length film. It was basically a play. It all takes place on the front porch of a bunch of smokers. And again, not a good film, but has moments that are genuinely good, good performances. I'll stand by it today. Even uh, what? uh, 15, 16 years later. Um, And that was bloodstone and we got it finished. And then there was a long break of doing theater and, exploring that more because i didn't have the equipment anymore or the money to buy it and and then i realized oh i'm i'm better behind the scenes like i love acting and still do it occasionally but for the most part i don't trust anybody else behind the camera because i do it all myself so um and i realized that the films can be the best with everybody out in front of them and me trying to bring the best out of everybody yeah 
So, so you inspired me to ask a question, which is you're very upfront and honest, uh, critiquing your youthful work. Always. But at the time you made it, what, did you just love it? Or, or is it over time or like at the time you, you, so in other words, I'm trying to find out, did you yeah. make it and go, all right, I didn't accomplish what I want to make. I got to make another film because each time I get closer to my vision or did you love it when you were young and now you look back on it and like, boy, the stuff I made when I was 19 wasn't, doesn't hold up. Well, it changes a little bit with uh, the adventures of Spartacus and Phil, which was the first one in high school. Um, we loved every second of it, even when it was bad, because it, we were two best friends uh, making a lousy movie together and we're laughing at every bit. And like we had a bunch of our friends and classmates in it. And we got we, we uh, accomplished getting teachers like respected teachers doing like goofy, you know, shit in our movies, including Mr. Flynn. He played the fifth Beatle in the movie. Um, he was the main bad. Um, and we had another teacher eat ice cream, swish it around in their mouth and then spit it back into a bowl. Like we, we got some, it's a terrible, terrible movie. It's so bad, but we loved it at the time. And, uh, and Bloodstone, no Bloodstone. Like I was proud of the performances and like, wow, this movie is amazing. What, what, what we did. Um, but it was not up to my standards. It was like, this is the best I can do. And it's, it's driving me mad that this is the best I could do, um, with, with what I had. Cause that's always been for me, the thing, like I had to accept this is the best I can do with what I have. Um, and that's even now, like I love every film that I've made. I have love for, and I'm incredibly proud of, and I do get closer each time being like, okay, this is, this is really close to what I wanted to accomplish or better, but still it's like, well, this is what we could do with the equipment or the money we had, all those kind of things. Um, and, but there's always, I am always going to be my, the harshest critic. No one, no one else can penetrate me with whether or not they like something because no one can be as harsh as I am to what we've created. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So, so you, you shared the, in, the ensemble and everything and, and how, by the way, I think it's a very uh, normal story of slowly recognizing that just things turn out a little better when, when you step behind the camera, you know, some people, I think creatives, if, if your creative energy, eventually you have to give up the acting side more often than not and jump back there because yeah, you learn over time that like, you can't trust your friends to, to, to direct, <laughs> you know, to, to man, handle that camera. But so I was, I was going to hone in on you, you recognizing that you had the talent to write for other people and throw it over to Sarah and ask, what is it like getting handed a script like bitter taste of ginger and knowing that he has you in mind? I mean, you're inspiring that lead character mm -hmm. and she's dominating the script. Like, what is that like to first read it? Should I, am I going first? <laughs> yeah, that was to oh, that you was for, for sure. Okay. Yeah, that was, um, I, I was, I'm, oh. I'm pulling you in. <laughs> um, I mean, I was definitely caught off guard by it because it's not a character that I ever saw myself playing. I've mostly played like cute characters or like one shot angry characters, stuff like that. So I saw it definitely as a challenge. And the fact that Brandon was like, you know, if you're not comfortable with this, that's cool. But, you know, I just want you to know I, I wrote this with you in mind. I think you would be really great. And that gave me that bout of confidence to go ahead with that script, to take on the challenge. And just in the back of my head saying, okay, well, you know, somebody thinks that this is good for you give it a try. Um, and I figured what, what did I have to lose at that point? I was like, let me, let me do it. And then the more I read into the character, I was like, okay, all right. I really like her. She's, she's, uh, she's a badass. I like her. <laughs> and I think the reason, I mean, it's funny to talk about reasons and I know you don't do it for the awards, but I think the reason why you're pulling in awards for that film is because it's, 
bold and you it's boldly written and then correct me if i'm wrong but i mean i think your performance likely takes it even an extra step in the, in the bold direction because it especially i can still i think i can remember the first time i saw it and just just to be moderately amazed at at the level of of commitment and the level of of specificity to such a challenging and and you know uh i mean how do you say edgy it's a i mean it's an edgy role Mm -hmm. definitely um and a lot of people might have had instincts to pull it back but i what i see on screen is it just pedal to the metal yeah well thank you (laughs) it was definitely a difficult character to get into and it took a lot of concentration. It took a lot of um, soul searching to figure out what emotions, what um, you know, past life events to pull from in order to get Ginger to where she needed to be. And getting her there, how did that affect you? Like, did it just sort of add to your acting arsenal? It did, honestly. I mean, I I learned a lot from this character, from this film in particular. I learned how to look inside yourself, pull from experiences, but then be able to turn it on, turn it off. And I think that's what kept me sane through the whole thing. Because there were times, I mean, we were filming at like one o'clock in the morning in the middle of October, and I'm covered in fake blood outside freezing and Brandon's like, no, we need to do it again. Another take, another take. And I just had to go, okay, cold Sarah has got to turn it off and Ginger's got to come out and here we go. And, you know, it was, it definitely taught me how to turn Sarah off and then turn the character on. Right. So you're not, you're not uh, bothering with methody stuff when, when he calls cut, Mm-hmm. You can go back to being Sarah. Oh, yes. Yep. I go right back. <laughs> and it's also, I, like you said, she's an absolute badass and and li- literally tears the screen apart when whenever she's on it, which is almost the entire film. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think we, we talked about people could go back and wa- listen to her or watch our Q&A because this is audio only, but mm-hmm. but the Q&A, we, we recorded the Zoom. Yeah. But you know, the film is uh sexy as fuck. Mm-hmm. And you absolutely just are were completely in charge of that, I felt. Well, thank you. I didn't feel that way at the time, but <laughs> it's it's good to hear that. Um I mean, definitely looking back on it, I I don't even recognize that it's me. I I kind of go, who who the hell is that? <laughs> um, but I mean at, it was one of those things like, okay, the sexier, the better. That's, that's what we're going for. Like, okay, I can, I can try to do that. <laughs> and I mean, I assume it's healthy for an actor to look at their, look at, look at the role once it's completed and, and uh, be surprised by it. Oh yeah, definitely. I think in my, in my mind, that's a job well done. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. All right, Brandon, I'm going to throw it over to you and, and ask, so what was it about the work you saw uh, Sarah do before you sat down and wrote this one that, that was there something specific that, that she's inspired? laughing? She knows. Cause I've told this story before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, there, well, there's a couple things there was. Um, uh, so part of it started because this is going to be a weird jump, but I'm going to, since we're, we're deep diving, when she first auditioned, I looked at her and I was like, this is a girl that likes Steven Universe. And I asked her that. I was like, um, are you a fan of Steven Universe? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, I knew it. And, and Steven Universe people are good people. Uh, I, I, I don't know that a bad person can like Steven Universe. Or if they've watched all of it, 
and they were a bad person. Not that I believe in good and bad, but uh, um, for the sake of talking about it, like they're going to be a better person after watching Steven Universe. So it started there and I was like, this is a person I'm going to get along with. And um, so right from go, I was like, there's going to be something special about her and no one else has jumped on it and knows how to use her and to get that what I see out of it. Um, and so, and the, there's a lot of people that I've worked with that have something in them. Everybody has something special about them, but you know, there's so many people, especially creatives that end up never getting to show that special side of them. And, um, so right from go, I was like, okay, there's going to be something. I don't know what it is yet, but there's going to be something. So, you know, bring her into the fold, have her play this role, have her rehearse with someone as good as Jenna McBreen, who was her scene partner in Price of Fairy Tales. Get her in the same room as me and Jenna and Elizabeth Shumway, who was my assistant director on that and is one of the best actresses I know. Like, between her and Jenna and me, like, this stuff's going to rub off, and we'll see how we work together. Now, Sarah was good from from go, but when you put people that are that good in the same room, you're bound to improve and explore and find, you know, those special qualities. And... um so it really started there. It started that early from go from jump where I just didn't know what it was going to be yet. And, um, a lot of my stuff is family dramas. It's more grounded and every piece I do too, you know, I don't want to do necessarily the same thing. And oftentimes whatever piece I'm working on next is a response to the last one in some ways. And price of fairy tales we were working on that at the time, and it was huge. It was a 10-episode limited series. It was supposed to be a small project with friends, and it just kept getting bigger. And it was a response to The Worry Doll, which was our previous piece that I had to make a lot of cuts to. And so Price of Fairy Tales, I decided I was going to make no cuts. And by that, I don't mean edit, but however long it needed to be, however long a scene needed to be, an episode needed to be, some of them are 23 minutes and others are 45 minutes, just however long. And all totaled, it ended up being like five and a half hours long. And it was a long rehearsal process, long shooting process. And the my affair piece, the piece I was cheating on Price of Fairy Tales with was Bitter Taste of Ginger. And I had written 15 pages and... It happened in part in rehearsal. Um, Sarah and Jenna were doing their scene together, which um, is these two women arguing because Jenna's character arrives late to a kid's birthday party where she's supposed to be be Elsa. Uh, Jenna really did play Elsa for a little while, you know, at like parties and things like that, like the whole princess thing. Um, And... uh, so her character arrives late after having a um, mental breakdown um, with her boyfriend. And she shows up late and disheveled and is just like, get me to the, the bathroom and I'll change and I'll be right there with those kids. And Sarah was playing the mom uh, who meets her on the lawn and is like, this is not happening. Like the, an argument ensues and it just keeps escalating. And... Um, it was a very heavy episode and it was like, this was a heavy scene, but was super funny intentionally, but being played straight. And the, the two of them are yelling at one another and it, it digresses to a point where they're just saying, fuck you to each other. And uh, Jenna's character is very used to saying, fuck you. Sarah's character is like struggling to get out. Fuck you. And then they just, it escalates. And then Sarah, uh, Jenna throws her coffee at Sarah and then, the, like, she goes to, like, grab at her hair, and then the two of them start fighting. Jenna's character is more experienced with that and fucking, like, takes her down and puts her in a chokehold, okay? And we rehearsed exactly what, like, it was written in the script that they fought, but how the fight was going to transpire was explored in rehearsal. And it got to a point where it was, like, one of the times in rehearsal we were playing around with it, and... 
I was like, Sarah, are you comfortable with um, with Jenna choking you in the in the scene? And Sarah's eyes lit up, but like not out of surprise or like, oh, no, but like at a oh, OK, <laughs> like we were going to go there with it. OK. And I was like, well, that's not where we were going with it, but it kind of seems like that's where we're going with it now. And, you know, that just got filed away. And, you know, um I was exploring like the lack of prudishness. Yeah. Like, and, 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 um, and, and also like, there was like a excitement, excite, like it was kind of like, like, it's like I'm embarrassing her. And it's it's her a little bit. unfair that only I can see Sarah's smile. Why am I saying this? And her laughter. <laughs> yeah. It was just like, it, I was like, that's a strange response to that. Um, and, uh, so then, you know, I wrote I wrote out this character and, you know, I had about the first 15 minutes of the film written and I, I brought it to her and we went to have sushi again. We'd, we'd become friends by this point. And uh, I was like, I'm going to treat you to some sushi. I got this some pages for you to read. And uh, but I don't want to just email it like I want to, like, actually hand it to you and, like, discuss it. Um, because yeah, even being friends already and having that dynamic, I was like, it begins with autoerotic asphyxiation, like the film, like that's not a spoiler. Like it's in the description, like it's the log line is, uh, uh, a, a recent widow takes up autoerotic asphyxiation to work up the nerve to kill her mother-in-law is the log line of the film, you know? So, um, I was like, that's not something you email. That's something you look at someone in the eye and be like, listen, let me talk to you about this. Um, and so we discussed it and I let her read the the beginning while we were waiting for our food. And, um, and was like, you know, if you're uncomfortable with this or don't want to do it or any of that other kind of stuff, you know, it, it's fine. We just, uh, we won't do it. It won't be the movie we do or a film I explore. But if you are into it, like, I think that it could really get at something really cool. Like, I think we could get at something really special here and really interesting. And, um, yeah, so it, it, the seed was planted there, but it wasn't like immediately we jumped into the film after that. Yeah. And with those first 15 pages, were you also, was is the visual style in your mind already? Or were you really just exploring that narrative? Some of it was there, but also I was considering doing it as a play. Um, because even before I approached Sarah about it, I, I not to take any face away, I'm not going to name names or anything like that, but I do, I go to see local theater and things like that. And I went to see a play that was really, really long and it was dealing with race and, you know, sexuality and, and rape and like some heavy stuff. And it had, no guts. It had no, it had no, um, it was the most tepid thing dealing with those topics I have ever seen. And it was long on top of it. And, uh, I very foolishly, uh, I had just a, the right amount of alcohol and people knew who I was at the afterwards. And I was with the cast at it. Like at, we were out having drinks and the director was there and, totally my bad. Like I'm freely admit it. Like I'm a very open and honest person. Like when I do something wrong, it was definitely my fault. I had just the right amount of alcohol where I was socially lubricated and the actors were feeding my ego in a positive way because they were like, you know, really taken with me. And also like I had mentioned like one thing and then people started asking for notes and I was like, well, that's not really my place, but you know, um, they asked me something very specific about the show. Like, when did you know X, Y, or Z? And I just stated it. And then all of a sudden I was everybody's favorite person. And then I made the stupid mistake of being like, this is what I would have done with it while the writer director is there. And Oh, like, the director had written it. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, and, uh, and I answered and they got angry and uh, called me in, uh, maybe a fucking idiot, something to that effect. And 
And then I tried to apologize and shake their hand and they wouldn't accept. And then my friend who was there was like, maybe you should go. And I was like, maybe I should go. What's funny about this story is three of the actors that were there reached out to me afterwards and being like, the highest of praise, <laughs> like just like the and and one of those uh, would later work with me regularly and became one of my regular players, you know, um, and, you know, so in art, you have strong opinions and it does rub people the wrong way at times. And I try not to put my foot in my mouth, but there are times when it's just the wrong combination. And I do something that I wouldn't accept from another writer director doing it to me like that's rude. Um, my ego could have probably handled it better, but, um, but yeah, my, and, and, but seeing it, I've realized since that, oh, there's no, you're not gaining anything other than actors in your corner, I guess. Um, so there's a benefit there, but you're not gaining anything by taking someone's face away, whether you meant to do it or not. The answer to it is in your work. Like, okay, I see this and it's not working instead of me trying to make it what I think it should be which I think is, you know, shouldn't be done in general because someone else made that. That's their thing. Instead of worrying about how I would have made it better, this is why I don't review movies anymore either because I don't like tearing down other work or, or critiquing it in that way. Um, I'm just going to say it in my work. I'm just going to make them, like, if I thought this movie, for lack of a better term at the moment, didn't have any balls, like, didn't have any guts, didn't have any, you know, uh, didn't go there in any interesting way, I'm going to make a play where we cho we have a woman get choked on stage by choice. And just front and center on stage, it's happening. She's in complete control and power in the scene and having someone and pressured someone else to choke her. And while she gets herself off, like just I wanted to take it as far in that direction as possible, because you're doing a movie or doing a play about rape and are and are making it the most tepid crap. OK, and not exploring female sexuality, not exploring what actually causes those kind of things or anything like that, like just really just bad, like the. Just I, I I don't want to keep harping on it. <laughs> but it. Like, it drives me so nuts. It drove me so nuts that I made a movie. Like, it drove me so nuts that I made a movie about a woman that um, the only way for her to express her voice is by forcing someone to repress her, you know, and, and forcing someone to restrict her voice because there's no one actually restricting her voice um, so that she can speak her truth you know, and really get to something interesting and get into the meat and potatoes of it, you know, really get in there and try to explore something interesting. And then when it realized it wasn't going to be for the stage and that it was definitely going to be a film, then I was like, oh man, we can get so much deeper into it. Like it's a different experience for the audience now. I think the play would have been more visceral in that way, like just forcing you to be there. But a film can do that, and I think we accomplished that. But it can also critique so many things about films and depictions of women in films, especially indie films, that drive, drive me bananas. Like, you, you don't have a studio giving you money. Like, you are the artist. You're the writer. You're creating a story, and you want to tell this bland crap. Why? Like, why? This is your opportunity. Like, there's no one pulling your strings. You should be saying your deepest truths. You should be really, like, figuring it out, getting at something. And so that was this. That was, you know, I was like, I need someone brave. And I think we talked about this on your, uh, on when we did the talk back. I need someone brave, not fearless. Sarah isn't fearless, which is a compliment that she's been given a lot. And I and I always come back that it's not a matter of that because it's not the fact that there wasn't fear. It's that she's a brave enough person to explore that and really get at it. And, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do it without her. And that's what I said from go. I was like, this is going to happen with you or it's just not going to happen. It's not I'm not looking for somebody else. This is a collaboration I want with you. And if you want to go on that adventure, I think we can end Marcy. Like, but it started with Sarah. But then very quickly, it was like, Marcy, if you don't want to do this, it's not happening. You know, um, and I've said that to performers and artists many times in the past. And some people don't believe me, you know, 
and have called my bluff. And then the movie didn't get made. You know, it's it's really a matter of that. And because I, it, there's some sacred stuff in there for me. And if I wrote this for you, don't get me wrong, I've rewritten parts for people at times. Um, but there's been other times where it's just like it's shut down. We're just not doing it, you know. And that was the case with Sarah. And she said yes, thankfully. High five for saying yes. Yay! Right? She did. And and she kicked ass with it and clearly dialed in. I was, I So what you just said inspires me to note something, which is I love that that you're giving a concrete example of how getting out in the world and watching, exposing yourself to art, going to plays, not just movies, not just sitting at home and binging Netflix, you know, even seeing a bad play can be inspiring. I think it yeah, should or, be. Yeah. Or I just, I just called that guy's thing a bad play and I never even saw it, but you never it, saw it. Yeah. But it's it all, is, it's all uh, hearsay based on what I said. Yeah, yeah. But it is, it is, uh, you don't just have to be inspired by the masters. Yeah. You can, all, all kinds of things can be inspiring. Definitely. If you're a part of the artistic world. Yeah. It was an important lesson for me. Uh, and, and I do, I mean, I bring it up now and someone from that play or worked on it might listen to this. And I, I that's why obviously no names for sure. Um, and, and I don't mean to hurt their feelings if they were listening. That's really not the goal either. It, it's, um, and actually I'm going to interrupt and, and add that, like, as we were talking about the four questions, that'll be the next episode. Oh, uh, yeah. cause there's the overrated question. And I'm saying like overrated isn't always an insult. You can say, I love this film. I just think the awards it got were not commensurate with, with the qual, you know, with that particular film. Yeah. I mean, this particular play we're talking about could have hit someone else right in the heart and been sure. exactly what they needed to see that night. Absolutely. Or it, it could absolutely resonate. Well, I mean, I, I am championing right now that I personally, you know, as someone who programs two film festivals and as the dude doing this podcast, I love when if you on your list in the next podcast say that the overrated film is like my, one of my favorites of all time, I don't get mad. I'm like, cool, because right. I love diversity of opinion, you know, particularly with art. So, yeah, it's just if something's not for us, we tend to say it's bad. Believe me, by the way, I've got a 14 year old in the house and I'm always trying to explain to her. No, that food's not gross. It's just not what you like. <laughs> right. Like, like, believe it or not, you know, I like blue cheese. I know you think it's disgusting, but it doesn't make either of us right or wrong. It's just differences of opinion and differences of taste. For sure. Yeah. And, and by saying that, I would never want to keep someone from creating whatever artwork they're working on you know, and, and moving forward and ke- and keep exploring things and whatnot. Uh, it's just, that really was, it's an important aspect of why Bitter Taste of Ginger was made. And, you know, like I said, that lesson, like, it's not something that I would ever do now, you know, and I realize that we're talking about a recent film, but we're also talking about this experience happening four years ago of me seeing this play, you know what I mean? And that might not even sound that long ago, but we, I think we, we 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 try to be aware of our journey as artists. You know what I mean? And when, when there's failings, I don't ever want to sugarcoat when I did something I shouldn't have done. And maybe talking about it now in some ways, well, you know, you should have learned your lesson, not even bring it up now. But it's the the rage, the rage of another piece of art being done poorly to my mind, inspiring a piece that's full of rage, you know, and full of, uh, um, the antithesis of whatever, whatever was driving me bananas about the other piece. You know what I mean? I'm sure there are far more people that don't like this film than didn't like that play. You know what I mean? So uh, there's nothing saying that I created something for the better just because in my point of view, I did. Um, it's, I think all art is in conversation with other art. You know what I mean? And while I don't think I I really don't like how film culture is right now, where everything needs to be torn down. 
everything that they don't like has to be torn down. Like Letterbox has the, like such a, I love Letterbox for finding films and all the other kind of stuff. But I, I, I can't look at any reviews on there in particular because so many people are going for a laugh and more likes on this social media film site. And like, it's all about like, Oh, how interesting can I make my review? Oh, people will like it more if I say something funny about how bad it is and like and tear at it. And so I think that it can be very insidious. And so I'm I mean I'm kind of contradicting myself in some way because here I am beating up this play and saying that how much I don't like that kind of behavior. But I think that the difference is it's But it's, you were at a bar. And you had some drinks True. in you, and you had people encouraging you. Yeah, <laughs> you I mean, you didn't run home and write an online review of this play. True, you you were you know it wasn't quite the same thing. Yeah, I think you were pretty much just bringing up the tragedy of troll culture. That believe me, there's there's films that we have at the festivals, and I actually try to. I'm not very good about it. I wish I was better, but I try to give all the films I love like five star. You know, like. I try to give them a good rating on IMDb. If they're on Amazon Prime, I try to give them a good rating. Nice. And, like, you know, there will be a a brilliant $5,000 feature that someone puts on Prime Video Direct themselves, and it's just creative and uh, wonderful feature film. Actually, I'll just pimp it right now. If, if people want to watch a really cool indie, watch Man Under Table on Amazon Prime Video. I think it kicks ass. I'm going to write it down. And on, and one of my, a really close friend of mine came to the festival and saw it, and he keeps calling it one of his favorites of all time. So he and I both write a review of it on Amazon. And then some motherfucker goes on Amazon and says, I, I, I pay, I, you know, I rented this film and it's just so cheap. It sucks. And I'm like, why are you renting? Why are you paying $4.99 for a film that was made on zero budget? And then your only criticism, and then you're bothering to criticize the right. budget? Like, yeah. just stay away from indie films. Just rent another Marvel movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. it's it, it, That's absolutely true. But, like, troll culture, people feel the need to, like, I'm going to go slam this. And I bet there was, like, 100 people who rented it and were like, that was really cool. And then they didn't bother writing a review because we only bother to slam shit. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, Which, definitely. I mean, I, and... Again, I'm on this journey where I'm trying to to not be that way that I once was. The, I think this shift needs to happen for artists where they stop being a critic and start being just an artist, you know. And uh, and you know, I've been in love with movies my whole life, my whole life. And for so long, it was looking at movies and trying to understand it on on a level where I could be the one doing it. You know, and so the critique and the harshness came from also an aggression about wanting to be doing it myself and not being able to. And if that's just not the case anymore. Yeah, I can be uh, envious of someone's budget and things like that. But it's uh, I, I don't feel like my voice is restricted to a point where I can't create. And so I just I don't need it anymore. Like, I don't need to bash a film i mean in pro- the privacy of my home or talking with you know for a friend or whatever you know we can talk about a movie and why it was bad and have a laugh but uh but for the most part like i took down all of my star ratings and i had several thousand i took down all my star ratings i deleted every review of a movie i didn't like even if i barely said anything about it even if i was just like it wasn't for me like <laughs> you know uh to got rid of all of it. Like it took hours. And I was just like, I don't want a, even a history of me rating a film. Like the idea, like I get why my brain likes it. I like categorizing things. I like having things in their organized place, but it's just not necessary anymore. Um, and it's, it's something that I'm going to try to like preach to others too, you know, to a certain extent, other artists where it's just like, you don't need to do that anymore. Like you don't actually need to do that. And I, by that, I don't mean, I don't like positivity porn either. Like, I don't like people just like throwing out like, oh, everything's wonderful. It's all so good. This is such a good movie. This is all great. Like, I don't want that either. I like that even less. I'm just saying that like, I'm not, I don't want to bust down them things anymore. You know? For sure. 
Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back in time now to to sure. an earlier topic. I'm I'm curious about the fact that Ginger was originally sort of seen to be a play, and then switched to film. Did you what exactly what caused the transition? Mm. Uh, well, for a little while we were talking about doing it as a play and a film. You know, it was a film was always going to happen. There was never a point where it wasn't going to be a film. There was just a point where it was going to be a play first. My the idea was let's put it on stage, let's do a piece of local theater, you know, and really learn it inside and out by doing it as a play, uh, as as kind of a middle finger to the safe stuff that was being done, you know, um, and also the other things it had to say. It wasn't just that, but um, and and then let's put it up as a movie, uh, and then let's immediately start shooting it as a film, and. Uh, a couple things happened. One, um, film is really our wheelhouse. You know, it's, it's, uh, it would be renting a theater and getting every working around everybody's schedules to rehearse it as a play and then putting up as a play, all things that could have been accomplished. This was 2019 by now, 2018 was when I brought Sarah, the original idea by 2019. I had it written enough that we could start exploring it. That was me and Marcy and, and Sarah. Um, and then, um, in early 2020, or excuse me, at the end of 2019, we brought in Chris and then it was the four of us working on it. And then early 2020, we had the rest of the cast assembled and there still wasn't definitely not going to also do it as a play, but it was like, we weren't talking about it as much. And then that idea was completely squashed once COVID struck. Um, the movie got put on hold and this might be a good segue into cue ball. Um, the movie got put on hold and then it was picked back up again um, in the fall of, or the end of the summer of 2020. Um, and we pulled in a couple new cast members we, because some people weren't available any longer. But mostly everybody was able to return. We started rehearsing a little bit. We, Sarah, Marcy, Chris, and I, we were doing like little weekly Zooms and then in person, just us. Then we brought back the rest of the cast and we shot it in the fall of 2020. Um, but between then, um, you know, at the height of COVID, um, well, fall of 2020 was still very COVID. -y. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh yeah. And that, that's a whole story on its own on, on the hurdles we jumped to make it happen. But, um, at the, the height of it, like still during the stay at home order here in Pennsylvania, where it was like, don't, you're not even going out. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, Sarah posted on Facebook. Um, well, you, you, I've been doing a lot of talking, okay. Sarah. Tell, okay. tell us what you post on okay. Facebook, and then I'll jump in from there. So I was really frustrated one day, and uh, I have, what is it called? Uh, tri triliomania or um, tri trichomania, something like that, where you, where you, when you're stressed out, you pull your hair. So I was so stressed out because of everything that was going on. I was still working at the time and I was really pulling my hair. And the one side of my head was definitely, the hair was much shorter than the other side. And I was so frustrated. I just posted on Facebook, I'm going to go full Britney Spears. I'm just, I'm done with all of this. And Brandon sent me a message and he goes, wait, 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 wait a second. If you're being serious about this, we have to get it on film. And I, I said, okay, sure, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's when he wrote Cue Ball. And I'm going to, I'll let you take it over from yeah, there. If you want, sure. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you can keep so, going, though. It sounds, you're, yeah, on you're a doing roll. great, Sarah. I'm doing good. Okay, I'll keep yeah, going. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, Tell your version, and I'll fill in some gaps version. if there's necessary. Okay, yeah. you'll probably have to fill in gaps. Um, so he wrote cue ball and the whole idea was um, domestic violence during the stay at home order. But instead of it being a man against a woman, it's spoilers. Sorry. Spoilers. <laughs> it's, okay. no, it's, no. A, it's a woman. <laughs> it's a woman against a man. So um, we had this whole scene where I was in the bathroom and Brandon's like, all right, you're going to do it. You're going to shave your head. You only got one take. 
no pressure. So I said, okay. So, um, by I the did way, it. I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump in and say the willingness to shave one head, one's head on camera <laughs> is bold as fuck. I, I well, you know, maybe courageous, not brave, courageous. I mean, my God, Thank I, you. I say that as someone who has shaved more than one head, but go on. <laughs> But yeah, it was one of those moments. I said, "Why? Why not? What else do I have to lose right now?" Um, so I did that, and then r- right after I had my very first uh, full nude scene, so that you know you got a two for one on on that one. Um, but honestly, filming cue ball was such an empowering moment for me. Not just because I shaved my head, not just because, you know, I bared it all on camera, but just everything that led up to it. And I had one of my friends who was there on set and she helped clean up my hair afterwards. Like after we did the scene, she goes, oh my God, that was amazing. She says, that was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen a person do. And, you know, if that was one person... If if anybody could watch this and get that and from from this film and it makes them a stronger person, then I I feel much much better and I feel like I accomplished something. Definitely. Yeah, Sarah. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. The, the little things that I'll fill in is just um yeah, here again, by this point, Sarah and I had worked on a number of shorts together. We had, we'd, we'd done several races. You know, we'd been friends now for two years. We'd been working on Bitter Taste of Ginger, but had to put it on hold. Um, I see this post from her, and I know I commented in it, but I also sent her a message. In, like Sarah said, like, if you're serious, like let's not waste that. Like, let's get it on camera. Cause originally she was talking about shaving her whole head Mm -hmm. and, um, and really no, like the second I read it, the entire film was in my head. Like, it's just like all of it. Like, uh, and you know, Sarah has, you know, experience doing, um, uh, like Instagram and TikTok videos and, you know, uh, modeling, and, you know, we were talking about mental health things and it was something that we were very interested. We just, we just got, uh, we were commissioned to do a PSA for NAMI right at the beginning, uh, National Alliance for Mental Illness, right at the beginning of COVID. And we did, um, we'll plug this cause it's very worth watching. It's only a minute long. Um, we did, um, uh, a PSA for them, um, called, uh, spread, Spread sunshine, not germs, at the very beginning of all of it. And it was about mental health problems being in isolation. But it's actually a really cute, funny, like, little one-minute thing. Jenna's also in it, and she begins it. She's the central character of it. And it's just her on her couch. The first 30 minutes is just all the things she's doing from her couch. And uh, and there was a cute cat involved and all this other kind of stuff. And it was very cute. Sarah shows up at the end and kind of helps her and within the messaging, you know, it doesn't mean you have to be alone and um, that should be watched on our Vimeo because it's adorable. And then we immediately had to reshoot it because the mask order came in at, in Pennsylvania where everybody had to mask up and no one was wearing masks. We were social distancing and all of that. But um, then we reshot the ending to include masks. And um, after working on that, I loved it and we all loved it and very proud of it. And uh, locally spread like wildfire. And since it was the local chapter, the Lehigh Valley chapter of NAMI, we were incredibly proud of it. It went on on TV and all the other kind of stuff. We we were so excited. We did a 30-second version. Um, that said, we also wanted to explore the much darker side of mental health and during quarantine and everything like that. And so when I saw this, like it all just it was just all there. Like the 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 heightened um connection with uh with social media and like the the being separated from the real world and it wasn't just issues during quarantine for me it was it was it was the dehumanization of all of that and the separation of that one of my favorite filmmakers is uh Michael Haneke 
And um, he made a movie in the 90s. It's not my favorite of his films, but uh, it explores some similar things. It's called Benny's Video. And um, you, you see it, he, he does a lot of frames within frames of you watching a TV that he's filming or watching something that's being recorded, being filmed. And uh, that's, it was no more pressing than now for sure. Like now it's, it's even, it's even more so everybody's filming everything. And, uh, and then adding in the isolation on top of it, um, adding in the Sarah's really dealing with the, uh, Tryptomalia? Trichomania. 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 We're probably both mispronouncing that. Not right. (laughs) Uh, And and apologies Uh, to other people. Actually, to be, because I'm a nerd, I Googled it. Oh, good. Trichomania. 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 Thank you. There you go. Yeah. Don't want to be insulting to anyone else that also deals with it, as Sarah does. Yeah. Um, And, uh, you know, I was so touched by uh, Sarah dealing with that. And... um, it's still the piece of mine that most consistently moves me, even though I made it, which is so haughty. Like it's so like pretentious, but, but it does. Uh, it, there's the, after she's, uh, after she shaves her head, my favorite shot of the film, she, she plays with it with her finger on the, on the sink. And, uh, there's so much to that for me. It's 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 both like uh it's it's been such a comfort for me to do this. But also now it's so isolated. It's such a little thing. Lord of the Rings quoting. Like it's such a little, you know, it's such a little it's such a little thing. Like it, this hair now on a on the sink and I'm so bound up in it. And then that leads to her breakdown and I'm already I'm already like emotional at that. Like that's that to me is more emotional than seeing the person actually break down. It's necessary for the storytelling, but like that's what really hits me. And uh, so it all was there. Like this person that that gets all done up and does videos and like is separate from humanity, and then the abuse with the the boyfriend, the domestic abuse. And Jeremy's amazing in the film, but I mean, it's, it's predominantly Sarah's character's story. Um, and then to the fact that the meme thing that was really going on in the world with the dropping of the towel as like a joke with your boyfriend thing, and it was so cutesy, the fact that all of that was lining up and then to strip it all away to this person wearing no makeup, you know, and just having shaved their head that I have never had cause for wanting nudity in one of my films more than in that we've done nudity in other films in the past, but it's not a common thing in the, in the pieces, but when it's necessary, um, there's just no beating it. Like there's no beating the image of someone being completely bare that way. And, uh, cue ball. I mean, that's it. It's a tough piece and it's very depressing and it's and it's and it's not emblematic of everything that Living Proof Pictures is. I mean, most of our stuff's very dialogue driven and it's not, but it is very visually striking in the way that I I try to bring to our films. Um, but it lines up with so many themes I'm interested in exploring, and it does it in such a tight 11, 12 minutes where I, I I dare say it's probably the closest I've ever been to executing my vision in anything. Like there's very there's very little in that film that I would want to change. Very little. And most of those things are just like knowing the camera a little bit better. And you know, there's a few things that uh, 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 that shot could have been a little bit better or, or better lit or better whatever. Like little things. But for the most part, like messaging, you know making something that couldn't be made without us is very important to me. Like I'm not interested in something that anybody could make. It felt important to our world. Like it actually felt like it felt lofty. Like I love bitter taste of ginger. It's, it's an amazing piece that I'm very proud of. Um, but cue ball is important. That's what, how I honestly feel about it. And especially like, that's a piece that I would love 20 years from now to be on a list of the 10 movies you should watch to know what 
quarantine and mental health issues and all that other kind of stuff. That's how proud of it I am, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, it's not for everybody again, because, you know, it is, it is on the darker side and there is full frontal nudity in it, which is uncomfortable for some people and domestic abuse is uncomfortable for some people, but yeah, I couldn't be prouder of that piece and I couldn't be prouder of Sarah, you know, and uh, tackling that. And, uh, and it was a small team. There was, Myself, Sarah, Jeremy, my friend Lauren, it was her apartment, mm -hmm. um, and she did sound for most of it, and then your friend, Melissa, Michelle, no, Michelle, Michelle. Um, and we wanted Michelle there for two reasons. One, to touch up Sarah's hair afterwards and make sure that, uh, you know, and but also uh, we wanted a woman on set, you know, frankly, because, you know, it's me and Jeremy and Sarah is the only one doing full frontal nudity, you know. Um, I believe Lauren had to leave for something mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a small thing, but I didn't even watch through the camera that scene, mm -hmm. like the directions were going, I was on, uh, like on the floor underneath the camera, like recording the sound and, um, and gave the notes on the timing ahead of time. Like that was pretty, that part was pretty blocked. Like, how long we wait with the sandwich bites and like the pacing. Cause it couldn't be rushed and all that other kind of stuff. And, uh, yeah. And that was just a day's work. That was, that film was made in a day and then edited in the following day. And just like the most expensive part of that was just getting the rights to the two pieces of music. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that's our only film to date. Our first and only um, that has ever been accepted at an Academy Award qualifying film festival. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. St. Louis International Film Festival. St. Louis, yeah. I have no idea. Sometimes people ask me, hey, uh, what about the Academy thing? And I'm like, I have no idea how to approach that. But congrats on that. Yeah, I Thank mean, Cue Ball is a great piece. And, and yeah, in a lot of ways, I agree with you. It is... It is uh, it challenges the audience even more so than, than I think bitter taste of ginger challenges them just because it is bitter, bitter taste of ginger. You do world building, right? And you create this world that is definitely in many ways, unreal. Whereas cue ball feels very real. Yeah. And, and that's what we wanted, but also, I don't know. It's like a painting to me. Like I love that piece so much and it's, and, and again, I'm going to say it again, like I feel pretentious talking about my own work in that way, but that's just because people don't spend any time in my head with how harsh I am usually. So, um, like I assure anyone that thinks I'm egotistical, which I am and arrogant, which I am like, I, I freely admit those things about myself. I am also like I tear into myself. Like I am the, the meanest person in the, like I am not nearly as mean to anybody in real life as I am to myself and my own work. Like it, it's, it, that's how I can go to these dark places with some of these pieces, you know? And, um, so when I speak so highly of my own work, especially cue ball, um, it's because I feel like we really earned it. Like we really got at something. Um, again, a few things that I would change for sure. Um, so it sounds like when you when you say that you're talking about the technical side. Yeah. And, like and, don't get me wrong, like I, we could have had better sound equipment, you know, I was still relatively new with that camera, the newer camera, um and uh you know, I know my way around it way better now. Um and by the time Bitter Taste of Ginger happened too, um little things, but again, all technical stuff. Like I don't think a single one of the shots would change like performance wise, maybe like little things here and there where I just give different notes, but not because the performances are bad, just because I'm a different person now. So we'd explore it a little differently, you know? Um, but yeah, the, also the thing with cue ball was um, that earned like Sarah got to a point in as being a performer and an actress where she'd grown to this point with cue ball where she did such a fantastic job. Like she was ready for ginger. Like we had been rehearsing for a long time and I don't say this as an insult, but like when I wrote it and handed it to her, she wasn't ready. 
but I knew she'd be ready. You know what I mean? And that's not me taking credit. That's just knowing that Sarah was going to grow into it. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to ask a a funny logistical question. And I say this as someone who shaved his head with a good help of, of the Lord. And uh, I had to shave my wife's head in 2021 when she had chemotherapy. But uh, so is ginger a, a wig? Because no. I know how long I, I'm this wonderful lady I live, I spend my life with. She, she is, uh, it's been, ta- it's taken a long time for her hair to grow back in. Mm. So the fact that the Q, I actually lived under an assumption until this very conversation that Q ball was, was shot after ginger because that's the order I saw them. And sure. like all simpletons, I think I'm the center of the universe. And, <laughs> and if I see one second, that's because it came second. Mm-hmm. No, I, for, so after Q ball, um, cause I, I had only shaved the one side of my head, the left side. So I thought, well, I could wear a wig. It's a possibility. Got some wigs. Didn't really like them. So I started parting my hair differently so that the one side would cover the shaved side. And that seemed to work pretty well. So I said, all right, we'll just, we'll just go with that. So that's a little bit of a, of hiding there, but. Also, we had two amazing Mm. makeup and hairstylists on Bitter Taste of Ginger. Um, One being Riley Longenbach, um, who did like some of the special makeup. She was really into like the blood side of things, Mm -hmm. but was doing all the other stuff too. And Steven Nazario, who's one of my closest friends, uh, was lead makeup and hair stylist. And um, yeah, they, I mean, they worked together quite a bit. Like that was your parting and everything like that. And then Steve, Steve made it look like, like cue ball never happened. And he also died. He also was the one that got my hair from blue to red. Got it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, no. And, and of course what you're describing reminds me of just how visually stunning most of ginger is and, and, and uh, yeah, a lot of the decisions that you made artistically there obviously came from this amazing team uh, because just the, the look and feel of, I mean, every character's look has, is just so well-defined. Mm. Yeah. And well, I'll always, I'll always, I guess, I guess we're kind of really dodging spoilers here, but I'll always love what you did with Chris egging that, uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, that's not a spoiler. You find out very quick that Chris is playing all the male roles. Yes, every male. It's in the trailer, which, even. Yeah, which I think is one of the. I think I said this before when we chatted before, but I just find it that I just love that commentary on that. Finally, men are being treated like ah, you got you seen one guy, you've seen them all. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that read on it. Uh, there, there's several reasons for, for exploring that, but oh, yeah, we discussed that at length in the, in the talk back for sure. For um, sure. And, uh, but yeah, the, the, just to go back to the makeup and also to bring in the quarantine thing or uh, excuse me, COVID thing. Um, Steve and Riley were also doing all of this during COVID. So they're in full PPE. They have both masks and a shield. And we were a very small team on that. Not as small as cue ball, but still really small. And the the core of us, the core group, was myself, Sarah, obviously, Marcy, of course, Chris, of course, and then the ones you don't ever see. Well, you don't see me, but I do all the talking. Um, and uh, it's is Riley and Steve, who were not just there constantly for makeup, but also pitching in as production assistants, doing sound sometimes, you know. And the the group of us, you know, we just said from go like we all have to be really careful because if any one of us gets sick all of us are getting sick you know everybody was careful on set but especially the what the, is that six of us the six of us the six of us you know we're we're really in it together and uh you know everybody contributed to the film everybody did amazing but the 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 five of them you know um, the movie wouldn't have happened without the five of them for sure. Not just because they were in front of the camera, but behind the camera as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so is living proof 
Living Proof is just going to keep cranking it out. Is that yeah. is that the vision here? You've got the you've got the equipment. You're you're a buyer, not a renter, and and there's just no stopping you. I mean, that's partly the hope. I mean, from uh, from a paying the bills standpoint, um, more recently, it's pretty much since um, COVID 2020. You know, we started doing PSAs. We started doing some commercial work um, and videography work. Sarah and I especially, you know, Sarah runs sound for me oftentimes or is just my general assistant while I'm there. And, um, you know, we've done a couple weddings, but weddings isn't really what we want to be doing. Uh, it, the weddings have been for friends, like people we know personally. Uh, and I, when it was day jobs for me, it was Hotel Bethlehem. And I did that for like seven or eight years working weddings every single weekend, hundreds of weddings. So it's not something that I want to do, even if it is a higher paying more in my wheelhouse area. Um, but the commercial and the ad work, that, that's that been really, really good for us. The PSAs with NAMI, we've been continuing to do. And, uh, you know, but all of that is just engine fuel. That's bringing our expertise for others and other productions and things like that for us, for living proof pictures, the main focus will always be, you know, the creative work, but the money being filtered into that is from the commercials and the PSAs and stuff. And so, yeah, the plan is to just keep cranking them out until they start paying the bills, you know? Um, and, uh, we're working on a feature right now, uh, called finger lace crown, and we've been having two rehearsals a week and we already shot a little bit of it, but all like the visual stuff, the, all the main scenes we start in October, we'll be shooting through the winter and into next year and uh, probably more shorts as well. But that's been the big focus, which Sarah is a supporting lead in and uh, Torres Mosley, who I mentioned earlier, she's playing our lead and she's reprising a role actually in a, a spiritual successor. So uh piece and, uh, That'll probably be our submission in a year or two from now. Excellent. Yeah. Well, uh, and Sarah, any comment about uh, when was the last time you got to act on stage? Oh, got to think about this. <laughs> I figured I'd throw one specifically at you. <laughs> okay. I would say, oh, boy. Last big one was probably I played Cinderella and Into the Woods in high school. That was that was my last big one. Oh, really? So so if Ginger had had a little life on stage, it would have been the first time in a while. Oh yeah, it w- it would have been the first time in a very long time. <laughs> Excellent. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I think we're we're good to wrap up. Anything anything either of you want to throw in? Hmm. Mm, I don't know. I think we covered a lot. Yeah, with this. we covered we covered a lot, and we got more to cover. And the you know we'll stop, we'll we'll stop, and then we'll do your four questions. We'll find oh, out nice. favorite films from both of you. But uh, thank you both so much. Absolutely, yeah. thank you, Joe. Uh, so people oh, who are, I do have one thing. Yes, I do have one thing for sure towards you, which is um, that. You are by far our favorite person to do talkbacks and these interviews things with. We've done a lot of them now. And again, this is not to build somebody else up by tearing somebody else down. There's been varying grades of how good they are. We get so excited to do a talkback or interview with you because you seem genuinely passionate about not just our work, but the work in general and like are actually exploring the conversation we're having to formulate your questions, which is, you know, may seem obvious to you, um, but uh, it is not obvious to most people. They have their, they have their questions and those are the questions they ask. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it doesn't matter who's going to be answering them. Um, You know, I, I am obviously when I get excited to talk. So like I get very verbose at times, Um, but I actually feel like you're listening, which is which is uh, a wonderful thing. And so we we genuinely, genuinely appreciate it and uh, can't wait to do more. I would love to joke that I'm just really good at faking it. But no, the truth is, <laughs> why would I do this if I didn't enjoy it and find what you have to say, what 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 you both say interesting? I mean, that's that's obviously look there. 
there ain't much money in film festivals. It's kind of, I mean, I, I think the first five of eight years it was volunteer. And, you know, I just, I don't think there's much, there are not many things more enjoyable for me than watching films and then talking about them afterwards, whether it's, whether it's with the makers or just with friends, you know, that's actually one of the things I miss about youth, right? When you're young, you tend to go to movies in groups and then you go to Denny's afterwards and talk about it over pancakes or whatever. Yeah. Like, I miss that. So this fulfills my wish to be able to, uh, to have conversations about, about film and art. I love that. I love that you're also interested in, uh, in theater and stage. And heck, after we stop recording, I'm going to mention a play to you that if you can ever catch it, uh, I think you would love it. Cause I, Please. but, yeah. uh, and I can't name the playwright, but it's called slave play. I feel like I've heard that. It was I've... very, I believe it won stuff. Tony's or something. Mm. Um, I should, I should totally know who the playwright is, but I don't, but I was lucky enough that (laughs) this doesn't need to be recorded, but my aunt and uncle who are in their, they're old. They're like 30 years older than I am. Don't do the math. They, uh, they had, you know, tickets to like the high end theater in downtown LA that they just, they would not use their subscription because of COVID. So I got to go to a bunch of supremely good plays that they wouldn't go to because they were a little too careful. Right. I guess because it was outside their comfort level. Yeah. So now, so now we we actually and they gave up their subscription and we bought a subscription. So I'm gonna see a bunch of kick ass plays because because yeah, there's something so uh special about live theater. Of course, yeah. Yeah. I mean uh Film is, of course, is, of course, my baby. I love it. It's it's my first first and main love for sure when it comes to the arts. Um, that said, um, I think the best film has its roots deeply embedded in the practices of theater and the things that theater excels in. Even though it's a, even though it's a visual art, like, um, yeah, the, the theater for sure the the focus on performances and dialogue and things it's it's yeah it's in my bones yeah and and i can tell i i why i really i'm just faking it now but the fact that sarah started in theater and did a lot of theater as a young person i think that's where an actor learns so much because it's the only type of acting where you get immediate feedback from an audience right Mm -hmm. when you're acting for camera you got to rely on that director but when you do a lot of stage, you you just learn so much instinctively from having human beings react to you in 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 real time. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. All right, well, anyway, I will. Uh, uh, so, people who want to support Living Proof, watch Living Proof. Uh, where should they go? Okay. Well, there's so there's a couple things for sure. Um, of course, anybody that wants to go on Letterbox or IMDb um, and give us some rates and, and reviews that aren't intentionally just there to get likes by tearing it down. I mean, tear it down if you want. I don't actually mind the the bad things, like especially with Bitter Taste of Ginger, mm-hmm. like a bad review is just as good as a good one because uh, I love the the polarizing nature of it. But uh, but yeah, you know, throw some stars. It doesn't even have to be a good rating, but just get some ratings in there because those numbers always look good. Um, there's that. Of course, you can go to livingproofpictures.com. Um, as far as um, if you need work done, um, you can always hire us for commercial ad work, PSAs, or videography. And if you are just looking for to see the films on Amazon, that we have our feature films, Macy on a Good Day, The Ground That Sinks. Uh, we have The Worry Doll. We have all 10 episodes of Price of Fairy Tales. A collection of our shorts are on there. You can see a lot of our shorts for free on Vimeo. If you go to our website, there's links to all, wherever you can see the films are available there on the website. And then the the biggest way, if you really, really want to um, just be involved in have, helping us grow, we do have a Patreon. And that Patreon, there are levels of support from $3 a month all the way up to if you are want to be a producer or, um, 
all the way up to $500. Or if you are a business yourself and want to be a sponsor, there's options there for that too. Um, and uh, But really, if you're just looking to watch the movies, head on over to the website and follow it. Some of them for free on Vimeo and some you can rent or stream for free on Amazon Prime. And and I'll encourage people, you should go to livingproofpictures.com and I'm sure there's a, a Patreon link there. You know, if you can if you can pull it off, you should uh, be a little supportive of of independent artists. Yeah, I appreciate that. I w- I wish I could. I often feel shitty about it, but as you know, I encounter you know a hundred people a year for sure. So I I certainly can't be as generous as I want. You know, I, one of these days I'm gonna I'm gonna strike gold, and then I can be super generous. But for now, all I can do is ask other people. To be generous. <laughs> you are being incredibly supportive. You don't need to hand us your money. <laughs> Although you should you should watch some of our older films that are not not as uh technically proficient as the ones we are now and, and see if our storytelling uh holds up as well. You know what? I will. I will. I've got uh of the eight hundred films submitted to the Sherman Oaks Film Festival this year, I'm down I only have like fifty-eight to go as of nice. Today. You know what? Oh. I'm going to submit movies that I don't actually expect to get in just so I know that you'll end up watching them. That's going to be what I do. I'm going to submit Macy on a Good Day from 2014 and The Ground That Sings. And Hey, you never yeah. know. You never know. You know, we we actually, one thing I'm proud of is we don't penalize if it's a couple years old, if, if it's... I actually didn't submitted. know that. Uh, Most yeah, festivals do. We, That's great. We don't even check. And, and we actually showed a film... That was on YouTube. Like a guy was like, it's been on YouTube for a while, you know, but I appreciate you doing. And we actually did the theatrical premiere of it. Wow. Now, did you, did you close submissions already? Yeah. Okay. Are there waiver codes? <laughs> not, not at this late date. I mean, no, I'm just was, teasing. Uh, I'm teasing. You was, have 58 uh, more to watch. I'm not going to add to your pile now, but maybe true. the film that's invasion. True. I just have 58. I hope a couple of the ones that are left are good. Sure. I would imagine. I always ask. You know, it's it's right. it's uh I think there's a last year was almost overwhelming with quality. I think so many people held on to stuff just like that that uh COVID effect your time out with yeah. festivals that were doubling. Last year we had a few more than this year, although not that many more. But the quality was insane because I think a lot of people who made something really good held on to it till COVID passed and they could get back in the theaters because they didn't want to have a virtual. Yeah, um, definitely. So, so now I think this year we, I don't know. I always, every year I sit there now, now this, this podcast ain't supposed to be about me, but every year I sit there and I'm like watching and I'm like, there's nothing good. The festival's going to suck. Like I have that, those moments of doubt where I'm like, we're going to have to, we're going to scrape the bottom. But then, then you do the math and there's like, a ton of films that the jury gave an average of nine to. I just, you know, a few, you know, a few and far between, but that's yeah. life. And right, probably well, you have more than you realize that are pretty awesome. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there, and there was some really, I've seen some cool shit so far. That's awesome. For, for sure. All right. Well, livingproofpictures.com. I'll say it one last time so that I can now jump into my spiel which is, thank you for listening to the podcast. It's funny, right here on the notes in front of me, it says, give five stars. I, w- I normally would have said, go go on Amazon, rent the living proof stuff, give it five stars. And then there's actually a TV series that was born out of this podcast on Amazon Prime. So go to Amazon Prime Video, type in Discover Indie Film, enjoy seasons one through six. Actually, four days ago, season six popped out. Nice. And... Uh, that actually came from uh, me run, doing this podcast just because I wanted people to be able to talk longer than they get at the theater. And I found out all the features were ending up on streaming services and the shorts were not very often on streaming. And if they were, they were lost in the shuffle, right? So so I talked to a bunch of people who'd done this podcast who had shorts and I was like, you want to combine all your shorts into a TV series? And that's what we did. So nice. we're on season six now. So. Go to Amazon Prime Video, type in Discover Indie Film, watch it. Sadly, we were part of the Indie Purge. We were up to 10,000 viewers a week, and then Amazon 
uh, sent us a note saying, uh, because there's some nudity and violence, you you have to not be free included with Prime anymore. You got to charge. Oh. Yeah. And by the way, they have every right to do that, but there's like almost no nudity and there's literally no violence. The, they actually targeted a, an eating disorder film for violence, as if oh. as if a woman having an imaginary woman bully in the room with her, making her eat until she throws up. That was violence? I don't know. So anyway, I'll shut up. If you want to learn more about this podcast or that TV series, go to discoverindiefilm.com. It's at DIF Wins on social media. And I will add that the two people I just talked to, Sarah Cugini and Brandon Lay, their film, Bitter Taste of Ginger, was at both Sherman Oaks Film Festival and Film Invasion LA, and Q-Ball was at Film Invasion LA this year. So if you want to learn more about Film Invasion LA, just go to filminvasionla.com, and it's at Film Invasion LA on social media. And that Sherman Oaks Film Festival, which was the first one where they won awards, you can learn about that festival that we hold every November, and I'm talking right now in September, so I just shat a brick thinking about how soon the festival is. But you can learn about that festival if you go to ShermanOaksFF.com, and it's at ShermanOaksFF on social media. Well, I'm pretty sure this podcast will come out right after the festival has passed. So, because I'm banking a bunch so that I don't have to record anymore while I'm cramming for the festival. For sure. And uh, I guess I will mention the last thing, which is, uh, I for fun, I did a thing called THC Cinema on 420 next year. We're going to do it again so people go to thccinema.com or at THC Cinema. you can uh, learn more about a little movie night in LA where people are encouraged to enjoy films with a little chemical enhancement if that's your thing but trust me the films are wonderful with or without weed but they're really good with what can I say all right <laughs> That's one you might want to travel for, Sarah. Yeah, if ever Bitter Taste of Ginger were screening at one of those. I definitely will be there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we'll talk. We'll talk. I wish, oh, I wish. I really do need to win the lottery and then own the theater and just like, you know, show show movies every night. Because, yeah, that would be the best. Yeah, for sure. And I've never, you know, I've watched Bitter Taste of Ginger start to finish, I think at least twice. Maybe, maybe more. And, you know, always in a sober frame of mind. Maybe I uh, maybe I got to try it with some edibles next. Yeah, <laughs> Sarah may have experienced like, yeah. it that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, you'll be my spirit guide. Love that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening.